next speaker, uh, let me get my slides up. Uh, you see, different, different countries and different Haifu uh, centers have different protocols. And I would like to share this because then we are hearing from somebody, uh, Dr. Raymond, who has really done uh, five years Haifu treatment on fibroids. And I would like to hear, let all of you hear what it is like to be so far away from China and, and to, to be able to do Haifu. And he has, and I understand, he has his own protocols for the safety of his patients and for the safety of our patients. I think every center should modify the protocols to suit the safety and the practice of medicine in your region or in your country. Let me introduce Professor Raymond. He was born in Johannesburg in South Africa in 1954, graduated in medicine and surgery from the University of Wittesand in 1978. He's consultant ONG since 1986. He's the head of Ghani unit at Chris Hani Barawanaf Academic Hospital since 1990. His main activity is gynecological surgery, oncology, uh, and especially with pelvic floor prolapse. He's the head of HIFU unit since 2016. So he has done HIFU ahead of many of us. Um, he's also the vice president of ISMIS. Uh, okay, without further ado, let's hand over to Professor Raymond Setson. And he's going to talk about uh, HIFU clinic application in South Africa for treatment of fibroids. Over to you, Raymond. Good evening, everybody. And um, thank you, Professor Lee and the organizing committee of APARS for inviting me to talk at this very auspicious uh, webinar. Uh, my topic is HIFU ap clinical application in South Africa for the treatment of fibroids. As I said, clinical application in South Africa for the treatment of fibroids. Um, just to show you on the map there, how far away we are from, from where you people are. We're right at the southernmost tip of Africa. Um, just to inform you about my hospital, it, as I said, it's the largest hospital in Africa and in the Southern Hemisphere. And it's uh, recorded as the fourth largest in the world. According to bed size, we have about 4,000 beds. And we service a population in Soweto of about 5 million people. Mm. It's a government hospital, which is affiliated to the University of the Witwatersrand, which is one of our three major universities in South Africa. It's the largest training hospital in South Africa. Um, the vast majority of our patients, more than 99% are black patients. We have the only HAFU center in sub-Saharan Africa. And treatment for patients is free. There's no, no, no cost for the patients. This is just a picture of the entrance of our hospital. So when we look at the, the, the fibroid profile, um, in South Africa, we have a, a population of about 58 million people. And of that 58 million, 29 million of the, of the population are black females. And when you look at the prevalence of uterine fibroids, it's, it's three to five times more common in black women than than in Asian or Caucasian women. So you can see that we have a, we have a, a big problem with fibroids. And the, the vast majority of our patients which present to our gynecological outpatient department present with fibroids and related complications. This is what our hospital looks like. It's overcrowded. There's always hundreds of patients waiting to be seen. So when HAFU came along, it was a, it was a godsend for us. Um, looking at our unit, we've started operating in October of 2015. I'm the only doctor, unfortunately, who, who does the HAFU. I'm assisted by three sisters, and to date we've treated 460 patients. This is the machine that we use. We use the model JC200, which is from HAFU from Chongqing in China. Looking at our patient profile, um, our patients are a little bit on the challenging side. Um, as I said before, the vast majority 
In fact, all the 460 patients we've treated to date are, are black patients. We have a big problem with obesity. And according to a survey done in 2017, they found that by the age of 20, over half of all South African women are overweight. And by the age of 45, this figure had gone up to 82%. Now, this is a problem for, for both traditional surgery, um, whether you're doing a myomectomy or hysterectomy, but it's also a challenge for, for HIFU. So it makes the cases more difficult to treat and there's increased side effects. We also have a very high HIV infection rate. Um, about 20% of, of South African women of reproductive age are HIV positive. Um, and this, uh, this is a, a danger to our medical staff during surgery. Uh, patients, uh, often with these big fibroids, we've got two or three assistants. Um, there's lots of hands inside the, the abdomen, and there's a good chance someone's going to get a, a needle stick injury. So surgery is quite dangerous, whereas with a HIFU, we don't have this problem. Another problem with our patients is we have a, a very high infertility rate. Um, also, we have in, in nine different tribal groups. And from all these groups, we have many varied traditions and cultural beliefs. Um, one of these is that in order for a woman to get married, she has to first bear a child. So marriage, marriage, marriageable status is, is related to fertility. Um, and also, the more children you have, the higher your, your social status in, the, in, in, in your area. So there is an intense desire to preserve the uterus. So again, HIFU plays a vital role for us in terms of these patients. In, with the socioeconomic issues, unemployment rate in South Africa is, is very high and it's increasing on a daily rate. Um, so this creates job insecurity. Patients are, are very nervous to, to come in for traditional uh, surgery. They, to take off six weeks from work, they're worried that when they come back, they'll have lost their job. And also it's difficult to get sick leave. The employers are very reluctant to let them take off six weeks of leave. So they, they're not keen to have surgery. Another problem with our patients are they, they're late presenters. So they always seek alternative forms of treatment before they come to us, whether they're traditional healers, herbalists. So by the time they come to see us, they've got massive uterine fibroids. Another problem is um, they see an abdominal mass and then they suspect they're pregnant and then they don't go and seek any, any treatment. Also, our patients don't go for routine checkups. They will only come to hospital when they are sick. Uh, they also have a fear of hospitals and a fear of surgery. So as a result of all this, they present very late. And then when they do present, the uterus is over, it's large. They have massive uteruses with multiple fibroids. Um, here are some pictures just to show you the kind of patients that we see. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, some MRIs of the of the of the uteruses. So we see very large multiple fibroids, and as a result, our patients also have extreme symptoms. So they have severe menorrhagia. We have a very high anemia rate. Um, patients with severe dysmenorrhea, besides all the other symptoms of uh, of, of of big fibroids. Another problem with our patients is I mean, usually fibroids will present at about 35 years of age. In our population, we see large fibroids as early as 18 years of age. And they also, at this early age, they also have extreme symptoms. So for us, HIFU has, plays a, a major role if you look at all, our, all those problems that I've just discussed now. Looking at the, the inclusion criteria for, for our patients, uh, the, the, the four main ones are that the abdominal wall thickness should be less than six centimeters. We go up to a uterine size of, of 18 weeks. We have, they must also not have major abdominal scars on the, on the anterior abdominal wall. And they must be able to communicate with the doctor. We get a lot of patients coming from outside our borders um, that don't speak English or any of our uh, African languages. Um, and this creates a problem because the patients need to communicate with us during the, the procedure. 
the rest of the, the inclusion criteria there are the same as for most other places. In terms of exclusion criteria, well, as we mentioned now, if the abdominal wall thickness is greater than six centimeters, there's an increased chance of getting skin burn, so we won't treat them. If the uterus is greater than 18 weeks in size, again, we, we, we won't treat. Large abdominal scars, numerous fibroids. Um, if the patient is, is desperate to, to, to fall pregnant and they've got lots and lots of fibroids, then we would rather recommend that they go for surgery. If they're not in a rush to fall pregnant, we will treat these patients with numerous fibroids. We'll just do it at multiple sittings. Intracavitary fibroids also is a, is a contraindication because we don't want to damage the endometrial lining. If they've got large pedunculated fibroids with a thin stalk, again, those are we won't treat because there's a chance they can uh, break off and fall into the abdominal cavity. And as I said before, if the patients can't communicate with us, we won't treat them. This is an example of some of the patients we see. Um, obesity with a very ugly scar in the proposed uh, ultrasound pathway. This kind of patient we can't treat. So fibroids has a, the, has a major burden on our healthcare system. And if you look at the traditional treatment, whether it's a myomectomy or a hysterectomy, they have lengthy hospital stay with overcrowding of the wards. Um, at these procedures, if you're doing a myomectomy on one of these very big uteruses, often we use two or three units of blood. Um, and in our country, blood is, is very expensive and it's a, a scarce commodity. And also there's a long waiting list for, for surgery. So we have a backlog at any time of about 450 patients, which equates to about six months. So the healthcare benefits of, of HAFU at our hospital have been to, to shorten the stay in hospital. It frees up theater for more urgent cases. We have lower running costs. We have decreased exposure to HIV and a, a decreased dependence on blood. And the benefits for the patient are, well, obviously the, we preserve the uterus so they can retain their fertility, which is a very big problem in our, in our population group. And also being non-invasive, the recovery period is much shorter and the patients return to work much quicker. Um, within one week, they're back at work as opposed to six weeks if they're having a myomectomy or a, or a hysterectomy. So just looking at our results so far, um, to date we've treated 460 patients. They've all been black patients. Um, the age uh, varies from 18 up to 45. Um, and the weight varies from 43 to 115 kilograms. And as you can see, the abdominal wall thickness varies from 33 to 64 millimeters. So um, the vast majority of the fibroids that we've treated have been anterior fibroids, intramural fibroids, and the vast majority have been hypo intense on, on T2 MRI signal intensity. Uh, the vast majority of the uteruses have been antiverted. Um, if we look at the patient's symptoms that they present with, 73% uh, presented with dysmenorrhea, 71% with menorrhagia, 68% with anemia, it's an HB of less than 12, infertility 53%, constipation 37%, and uh, urinary tract symptoms in 35% of patients. If you look at the, the treatment time, um, for a small fibroid, a two, three centimeter fibroid, we've done it as quickly as 14 minutes. And some of the big multiple fibroids have taken up to over three hours. In terms of major adverse events um, that have occurred following on HIFU, in, of the 460 cases, we've had two cases of first degree skin burns which healed spontaneously on their own within about two weeks. They didn't require any skin grafting or any other management. We've had no bowel injuries. Now, with those big fibroid uteruses trying to do myomectomies or hysterectomies, a uh, very good chance you're going to get a bowel injury. The same with bladder injuries. We've had no bladder injuries. <laughs> We've had two cases of, of, uh, of nerve injury, which again, um, resolved spontaneously within six months. They were, no, they were not left with any sequelae thereafter. 
Now, the interesting thing here is we had one patient who developed rhabdomyolysis um, and went into severe renal failure that um, was irreversible and required, had to, had to get a, a, a renal transplant. Um, but on investigating this patient, it was found that she actually had underlying, undiagnosed, rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. So it wasn't that we caused the, the rhabdomyolysis per se. It was we just brought it on a bit earlier. So all our patients, before they start treatment, and then again at one month, three months, six months, 12 months, and 24 months, fill in a, a health-related quality of life uh, questionnaire. And if you can see here, um, before treatment, they had low scores, uh, poor quality of life at about uh, the point score of about 35, and how it slowly increased and up to, at 24 months, it was already up to about almost 80. So there was a marked improvement in the quality of life in our patients. <clears throat> if you look at the symptom severity score, again, this is done uh, the same as the, the quality of life. Um, they had marked symptoms before the treatment, uh, just below 60. And then slowly over time, up to about 24 months, it dropped down to just below 20. So there was a marked improvement in the symptom severity. Looking at the, the shrinkage rate, um, at one month, we, we were seeing figures of about 31%, which increased slowly up to 12 months. We only saw, uh, saw them up to 12 months initially, and we had about a 73% shrinkage rate at one year. So if you look at our fertility successes, we've had 16 cases. Eight patients are, are currently pregnant at the moment. We had one four kilogram vaginal delivery, and we've had seven term cesarean deliveries. Um, one of the cesarean deliveries was a, a twin delivery. Um, the reason also why we probably have such a, a low success rate is our patients um, don't, they're very poor on follow up. They don't come back. A lot of the time, I only heard about these cases from uh, fellow, from colleagues who are in private practice. So um, very often we don't get to hear about their pregnancies. This is just a, a gallery of, of some of the babies that we've delivered. These are just some cases that I'll quickly show you. Here's a 40-year-old patient uh, before the HIFU, and then one and a half months post HIFU. You can see there's an ablation rate of about 98% and a shrinkage rate of about 27% already at one and a half months. That's a 32-year-old. Okay, there's before, on the left is before, four months post HIFU. It was an ablation rate of about 98%, 60, shrinkage rate of about 63%. This is a 27-year-old, ablation rate of about 71%, and at 23 days, the shrinkage was 8% at uh, just under a month. In this patient, she had multiple fibroids. Um, we, again, we can see that there's a a good ablation rate in, 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 in the, the posterior and the anterior fibroid, and the pedunculated fibroid sitting up on top only had 41%. They don't do well, the pedunculated fibroids. So in conclusion, um, we, we have found that uh, HIFU is a, is a safe and effective alternative treatment for, for uterine fibroids in our black patients. The results have been very promising, and we, there's great potential for improving women's health and it's made a, a huge improvement on the burden on, on our hospital. Thank you.